here is New York. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity. But the settlers give it passion. E.B. White would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at Elizabeth Collective, historic mansion in Midtown New York, where art and design live together, curated by Mazon Girard. Welcome to Spring Dialogues. The Design Triennial just opened at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum is particularly interesting this time. It focuses on the intersection of design with nature and science, bringing some radical solutions to the future of our planet. Some of the most creative and intelligent thinkers are represented in this show, and we have here Sam Van Aken, whose Tree of Fortis Fruits is one of my most favorite projects. Hi, Sam, and thanks for coming from Syracuse. Oh, thank you. So for what me. is Tree of Forty Fruits? So the Tree of Forty Fruit is a single tree that grows 40 different varieties of stone fruit. So those are peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, and even almonds. And they all grow from, from a single tree. And the tree was essentially designed so that in spring it would blossom in different colors. So it blossoms in white and pink and some crimson. And then in the summer it bears a multitude of fruit. So July through September, it'll grow all of those different varieties. And I found it interesting that you grew up in a farm because I grew up in a farm too. And you came back to farming as a contemporary artist. Uh, yeah, so um, my great-grandfather um, actually made his living as an orchardist. So he would graft uh, trees, and he grafted a lot of the peach trees in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I had never met him. Uh, he passed away before I was born, but um, even though I grew up in a sort of agricultural community, one of the things that was interesting was that Everybody talked about him as if he had this mystical <laughs> uh, capability. It, grafting has always fascinated me. I mean, I saw it when I was very young. And then um, I think one of the things after spending 18 years farming, I was really eager to get away from it. So <laughs> that I, I think was sort of the turn to go to, um, to school for art. And, and through this project, you have become an expert in stone fruits. Through the process of creating the Tree of Forty Fruit, I started to collect all these different heirloom and antique varieties. So these are all varieties that existed here before 1945, which is really considered the dawn of industrialization. How do you perceive your project and your entire um, initiative as a contribution to issues of conservation and also sustainability? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't set out to have that type of impact. I, I really started the project for aesthetic purposes. I was very interested in this idea of transubstantiation of all things, which is this idea of, uh, you know, where the appearance of a thing remains the same, but its reality changes. And so I wanted something, this ubiquitous form that would change, right? And it change its reality. And so that was really where I began the project. And then as I started to collect different fruit varieties, I, I started to discover the history behind them. And so in addition to preserving the actual fruit itself, I started to preserve that history as well. What's the reason the fruits that we buy in the supermarket are barely edible? Yeah, I, and a lot of, uh, most of it has to do with the fact that they're grown for how well they ship, right? And how long they'll keep after picking from the tree. So uh, just in New York, 40% of our, our food comes from California, right? Which is kind of crazy to think that all of these fruit are being trucked across the country. And 100 years ago, New York State was the second leading producer of fruit in the country.
Terraform One is a non-profit activist design group which seeks to introduce new ways of living, of treating the environments, the cities, the landscapes, and the energy. It aims to use technology and to use science to build an optimistic future. At the Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial, it presents a model of its upcoming Monarch Butterfly Sanctuary Building. When this project will be built in Chelsea, New York, it will be like no other building in the world. Hi, Mitchell Joachim, you are the co-founder of Terraform One. Why? Monarch Butterflies. The Monarch Butterfly Building is very much about uh, preserving a species that's red-listed. It's almost on the edge of extinction. And these are these beautiful orange and black butterflies that we've seen all our lives. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and they're disappearing. Uh, my daughters won't see them. We'll probably, uh, in the next 15, 20 years, never see them anymore. And there's many reasons for that, but right now we need to be engaged in preserving them just giving them the right to survive. So the monarch is disappearing. And we've lost, if you count the numbers, which is difficult, but roughly over a billion since the 70s. That's nine out of 10 of these specific butterflies are gone. And that's because we take out all of their habitat, the suburbs that we build, the projects that we do in cities. We kind of remove the precious thing that they need to survive, which is milkweed. So we thought of a building in New York City that inside the facade of the building, uh, it's a double skin facade system, we would plant a habitat for monarchs. It goes up eight stories, and then on the top is a pollinator garden and an education center, and then it continues into the back where there's another kind of uh, um, system for milkweed. And all of this is about attracting monarchs to the building so that they can propagate inside there, live, survive, and have a kind of a way station as they move around the city. You, you, in your practice and also in your research, you are, con you are very much concerned with the future of our planet, with sustainability. Who are your clients? As a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, Terraform One doesn't normally take on just private clients. Uh, we actually look for all different kinds of actors and agents to engage in thinking about the future of our cities and, and certainly our planet. So it's anyone that uh, has what we would call wicked problems that need some really smart people to work on them for a long time. And we take on issues in waste, food, water, energy, air quality, mobility. I mean, we work on a whole host or gambit of problems because you can't just solve one thing. You need to solve things in succession and in relationship to each other. We have 11 years, according to the United Nations to get things right before we achieve a different level of global temperature. And that's 0.5 degrees rise in Celsius to 1.5 degrees. And apparently there's, there's no coming back if we do go above that amount. So two degrees rise in temperature is uh, game over. You, how can yeah. we, all of us, like yeah. everybody, contribute even a little bit to the, uh, to, to the issue of the environments that are so, critical right now? Uh, I would weatherize your building. I would think about all the different stuff that happens in your house or a commercial space that is just energy intensive and ridiculous. When rock designer Malini Burnett realized that black designers are excluded from representation and not getting equal opportunities in the business of design, she decided to act. Together with a group of powerhouse designers, she founded the Black Artists and Designers Guild. Malini, hi, how are you? Hi, Daniela, thanks for having me. Malini, do you feel that black designers are having less opportunities because of their racial identity? Yeah, I really do believe so. And it's not a feeling just coming from me personally. It's the feeling from all of my colleagues. You know, we're in a country that was built off a system called racism that we all are very familiar with and we experience. 
The problem is that black people were never um, a part of the design of the system to be successful. So what happens is over the years, as you could see, you know, I'm only going to focus on the design industry. If you look to see who are getting the top projects for buildings or for interior projects, who are getting the, the collaboration. If you look on the art side, who's getting represented as far as the galleries and museums? And you could count how many black people are in those positions. And that's where you could see there's an issue. The disparaging of the number of our white counterparts are getting more of the opportunities because there is a specific funnel the way this industry works is that once you get invited to whether it's the, the parties or the, the events or you're within the proximity of the decision makers, that is how our businesses are growing. But the problem is that we're not invited. We're not considered for those type of opportunities. Well, what was the moment, if you remember, mm -hmm. that you decided you're going to find this organization? Well, it, it was something that was, you know, stirring in my head for a while, but it was the moment in September. It was during an event at 200 Lex, which is a prominent design of building, course. everyone knows, and it was at What's New, What's Next? And a friend of mine, designer, she, um, let, she informed me, said, look at the roster, look at the roster of speakers. And there are like hundreds of speakers. Yes, and there was not one black artist or designer who was a speaker or moderator. And is there any story that you can share with us, with me, um, of one of your members that can really enhance the, the problem? Well, there have been many stories amongst, like specifically, I know the designers, they don't get the respect, like going into, say, the D&D building or, the, or 200 Lex, where they think that they're either the messenger or they're the assistant, that they're not getting the respect that they're the actual designer or the head of their companies. May I ask you a political question? Sure, go ahead. I hope I have the answer. <laughs> How do you see this organization in the larger story of what the black community is experiencing today under this administration? I think the organization is going to be the outlet for a lot of whether um, current professionals as well as aspiring designers. It's going to be a safe place for us to feel accepted, a place for us to express our creativity and our point of view, and also our culture. I think it's going to be the place where not just only the black community is going to be inspired and learn about black art and design and culture, I think the, the community at large is going to want, is going to be attractive and understand that how much they don't know about the black experience. And, and I know that you're very much into social media, yes, especially Instagram, <laughs> because I saw you the other night at the <laughs> 90 seconds read to why and you said you are addicted to yes. Instagram. <laughs> are you also, do you also have a presence for the Black Artists and Designers Guild on Instagram? Yes, we have our own account and it's called at Bad Guild and I purposely um, create a whole row for the designers or artists that we post. So there will be a profile picture along with two images of their work. So when you look at the feed that you could just scroll down and you say, oh, there goes so and so and this is their work. So it's very easy to identify the designer or artist and their work. In this year's Kips Bay Show House, I love the entry gallery and staircase designed by Richard Rebell. These spaces stand out for the historic narrative, which gives them layers and layers of textures, colors, and stories. Richard, congratulations. Thank you. And we've known each other for so long. So I really loved, I know your passion for history, and I loved seeing that you were inspired by a very specific moment in the 19th century called the Aesthetic Movement. And that was a short-lived movement that came to advance the idea that art should be enjoyed, art for art's sake. In other words, there is nothing beyond this, just for the pleasure. Why did you use that? Uh, why did you go back to that moment? One of the reasons I selected the aesthetic movement is because it's a seminal point in art history where, as you said, it was art for art's sake and art was not supposed to teach you anything. It was just about the beauty of art. So one of the things about, I like about the, the aesthetic movement is the really saturated colors that were used during that time. 
You know, there weren't really pastels necessarily being like used. Like very jeweled type of colors. Like juicy rich. and very rich. And, very uh, rich, uh, like reds and turquoise and everything mixed together. So when I was thinking about doing a room, I thought, what era of art history would have that? And, and, and it was, it was clear to you that you want to go to history? I, well, the thing is that, you know, one is inspired by a lot of things. And uh, when I saw the staircase, one of the things that I, was, I thought about was this program, uh, this television program called Mr. Selfridge's. The entry to Mr. Selfridge's house was uh, taken in the, the home of uh, Lord Leighton in London. And so the saturation of those colors and just the whole play of the colors and the design was really interesting to me. So when I got the staircase and entry, at Kipps Bay, I thought I wanted to do something that evoked that era. And, and you also selected your leading motif is a very important symbol in the aesthetic movement. It's the peacock. And one can't help but thinking about, well, I'm thinking about two houses. One is the peacock room, which was one of the most scandalous interiors probably in history, now in Washington, can be seen by anyone. And the other one was called the Peacock House in Holland Park in London. You know, the Peacock House was, was a house that was built for the Debenham family, which were retailers. And, and you know the story about this house is that the husband created this house as a surprise for his wife for her birthday. And then he just, it, it, it was built, I mean, you know, there's labor intensive, and then she just came to the house as, you know, as a birthday surprise. I want to ask you about the aesthetic movement as an interior designer. Why don't we love the aesthetic movement today? I think times have just changed and people are more interested in a more simplified life. It may be as luxurious as it was back then, but I think much more simplified. And at the time in America, it was really very special, um, seen in the homes of all the elite industrialists like the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts. Everyone had aesthetic movement homes. In his new book, New York Design at Home, Anthony Yanachi reveals how New York City interior designers and architects live in their own homes. Those who are known for interiors they've done for others open their homes and show the power of living in one's personal space. Anthony, thanks for being here. You live in LA, right? I do, thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So, you know, I'm thinking about those houses. First of all, I love the book. Thank Beautiful you. Beautiful photography. Beautiful book. Um, thinking about um, architects from the history, such as Frank Lloyd Wright, maybe Eileen Gray, um, Arthur Elrod, uh, those people had very famous homes that have become icons in the history of design and they typically use their homes as a laboratory to create the ultimate expression of their own vision. Mm -hmm. Is this true with the homes that you feature in your book? It is true to a certain extent, but I do think that there are other factors that are weighing heavily on some of these architects and designers when they make a decision about where to live and how to do that. And New York in this specific moment represents a huge amount of challenges for anyone trying to find a place to live. At the same time, I think we're in a cultural moment where people very much want to find comfort in their own homes. How, how are you surprising your readers? Well, you know, the thing is that um, some of these folks live in much sm smaller, much more modest homes than one would imagine. And that's interesting, and I think that is also very insightful for your average reader, uh, how to make a one-room apartment into something really spectacular. But in addition to materials and finishes, they're also examining ideas of space, formal, informal, and how to use space. Because what's happened to many of these architects and designers is that with the client extracted from the situation, 
they're able to really focus on the context. You've published many books about interior design. I think this is your specialty. Yes, it is. And this is how we met each other initially, yeah. your other book. And I want to ask how this book is special to you. Well, it's special to me because I grew up here in New York and I went to school here in New York. And even though I live in Los Angeles now, I'm in New York at least one week a month. So the city is mine the way it's yours, and every New Yorker feels that they own a piece of this big apple. And it was special to me to really rediscover parts of the city that I didn't know previously. And I want to ask you this, this book. Um, let's say students of mine, how can anyone living in New York, what can they learn from this book? Well, I, I hope that there's a lot to learn. And I, I think it's the primary lesson would be a, a how to apply creative solutions to make the best out of any space. Anthony, thank you. And I want to congratulate you for the new book. And I know you're going now on many book events. So good luck. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks for tuning in. Until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode was brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.